Welcome to another game review. This one's going to be really short, I believe, um, but I just got a Kickstarter in, uh, and this is a solitaire fantasy game that basically recreates in a one-player fashion the old pen and paper D&D RPGs, uh, and this is called Dungeon Runner from Power Cell Games, uh, and I got three decks as part of the Kickstarter. Um, each deck represents a theme, so the Ruins of Nord, you're going through ruins, uh, cathedral here, and then Forest of Torment. Uh, I don't know how many packs are. It looks like there's maybe 20 different boxes. Each one comes with a hero, uh, a bunch of monsters, some equipment, uh, and you just play through it uh, flipping the deck like you're going on the adventure, either outdoors, in a dungeon, uh, etc. Uh, then you can continue with your character on through different decks. You can mix and match the decks. You can take move your characters around. Um, and then there are some rules in the rule book uh, that uh, talks about how you play your character over a long haul versus a one-off uh, game. Uh, each deck has a bunch of scenarios uh, and you just need to go online. Uh, it does not come with the instructions, so you go online, you print them up, and you print up all the different scenarios for each deck. And uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting little game. Uh, and I got it because it's a deck size. I can throw it in my backpack when I travel and uh, let's take a look at it. Okay, so let's talk about the components, the artwork, uh, etc. So all that comes with, with it when you order it is a pack of cards with an adventure with one hero, some monsters, uh, and you know all of the things that sort of go along. This one's sort of a forest themed one. Uh, the artwork is, you know, it's all black and white. It looks like old school, like uh, ruled school paper, um, minimalist art, but tells you everything you need to know. Uh, fairly simple. So what doesn't come with it that you need to play the game is either a pen and paper to keep track of your hit points and uh, uh, your power points, etc. Or what I've done is I just use the tokens out of my Gloom of Killforth because uh, they seem to match up fairly well. So I just use those to keep track of stuff. And then you'll need two a uh, ten-sided die. You can get away with one if you want to just roll it twice, but two is easy, and I just have a little uh, uh, dice tray. Um, the rule book, you have to go get it online and print it up. Uh, so, I mean, the rules are fairly easy to follow. Um, uh, they're fairly simple. Uh, they give you all the terms you need. And then the other thing you'll have to print up besides the rule book is each deck has the quests. So you have to go online and you'll have to print up the quests. So this is C1 Forced to Torment, and it has eight quests or nine quests that you can do. Ruins of Nar has its quests, and then you can make up your. There are a lot of made up quests on Board Game Geek, etc., uh, as well. Um, but there's a. Each deck has its own set of quests. And then you can mix and match the decks if you have more than one deck. Uh, so that's really, that's all of the components and the stuff you'll need to play the game. And it does not take up much space. I'm just using a, a game mat from a different game. Okay, so let me quickly go over the anatomy of the card. So your characters, each pack comes with one character. Uh, you have your to hit roll number, which you add to your D10, your armor, uh, which you add to your d10 when you're defending and your total number of hit points also gives you a class and then you have you know your standard strength vigor agility dexterity wit and you use these to make ability rolls uh, and as directed by the cards you just roll a d10 and if it is less or equal to your roll you pass and then it has your special characteristics on the bottom for example he gets plus two against hordes um, and he can spend one of his power points, which you get three of at the beginning of each game, uh, to do an extra point of damage. Um, and you may also send three animals from Limbo to the Oblivion to regain one power point. Um, the next thing, of course, are your uh, the enemies, or the monsters. So the name, level, uh, and they just give you a, sort of a general feel of how hard they are. Class, so different classes have different... Uh, abilities or you know you attack them differently 
Uh, and then they have their own abilities, uh, and there's a whole list of abilities. Uh, then, of course, they're the same number of hit points, uh, their armor class, and their to hit. Now, there are also uh, characters that you can add. Uh, you know, your henchman. So, in this case, an Olaf. Uh, he, uh, the hero gets plus two against hordes uh, when he's there. Uh, and then his guard number is five and his hit points. So, he can actually guard and take a hit and die for you, basically. Uh, then you could also draw items. Uh, they all have a value. Uh, they are something. In this case, it's a potion. And then the instructions about whatever the item is are down here. And it could be a scroll. Um, in which case you'd have to take an ability roll to see if you keep the scroll after you use it or if you can make it work. Uh, in this case, um, you can send the, he, this potion to Oblivion and heal two hit points. Um, if you do it in combat, you can uh, pass a dexterity check um, in order to use it and it takes up one of your, your action. Instead of fighting, you would do this. Uh, uh, and then there are curses and blessings. Curses are bad, blessings are good. It tells you about it here. And then there are uh, armor and items that you can wear. So in this case, it has a value of 400 gold. And it gives you uh, agility, armor class, and in this case, you gain plus one to avoid any trap. Um, but you have to have an agility of six in order to wear it. And then last but not least are the events. So in this case, it's a place. Uh, you find a village, uh, you can make three vigor checks, and for every success you heal a point. So, those are all the cards in a nutshell. Setup is relatively simple. I use a dice tray with a couple of D10s. I find a place to stick my tokens or your paper and pen uh, off to the side. Uh, then, you pick a hero. Since I'm only using deck C1, uh, there's only one hero in each deck, so I'm using John of the Ford. Uh, you just place him down, uh, and that's you know, your, your player, and you'll put uh, his armor and stuff around him as you go. Uh, next, uh, you have to go online and find all the scenarios for the deck. So deck C1, I'm just going to play the first scenario. I printed them up, and it's Slay the Giant. And it'll tell you what cards, etc., to pull out. So in this case, the Hill Giant is your bad guy, hence Slay the Giant, obviously. Uh, you put that in the bottom, bottom deck. Uh, then you remove... Uh, these four others out of the game. Uh, so, and if you can defeat the Hill Giant, the quest is complete. So, pretty simple one. So, let me pull these four out and then we'll get going again. Okay, so I have pulled out the four monsters that are not used and they just are not included in the deck at all. So, you set them off to the side and then the Hill Giant. Put that aside. You deal, I've shuffled the deck already. You deal 15 cards. And then take your main antagonist and you shuffle it into the 15. Reshuffle them. I'm not going to worry about shuffling it too much because they're already shuffled. And then you lay them down sideways. Right, so next, take all the remaining cards and you shuffle them up. and they become the top deck. So, they're right there. Now, up here is where you're going to have your Limbo and your Oblivion, which is basically the discard pile that may get reshuffled and put back in the deck, and then Oblivion is the pile that goes away um, and never comes back. So, just to mark that, I'm going to put the four monsters that... that's the Oblivion pile. The four monsters that will not be part of the game. So the actual play of the game is relatively simple. So I have uh, my hero with his power points, with his hit points. I have a few extra markers for hit points over there. Uh, I have my oblivion pile. I just stuck the monsters in there. Uh, and then, you know, the other discard pile. I have my top deck and my bottom deck. Uh, and basically, you just play through the top deck uh, until you get the bottom deck and you know that your quest is somewhere in these bottom 16 cards. Uh, the goal is, of course, to defeat whatever the final quest card is and uh, but you gotta get through all these other cards first and so the mechanics are fairly simple you flip over a card that's a turn 
Uh, in this case, I got a snake bane amulet, which uh, makes me immune to poison. Uh, you can wear one of each type of equipment or item, uh, and you can have up to six items in your backpack. Um, since I don't have anything, there's no reason not to wear this. Um, and then at the end I can sell it for 150 gold if I want. Uh, so I'm just going to wear that uh, just in case. So that's the end of turn one. So turn two, you just keep trudging through the dungeon. Oh, wait, I'm on my adventure and I find the ruins of Nor. And this is an event. And in this case, it says if you wish, you may place this adventure that you're playing aside now. You mark exactly where you are, just put it away. Um, and then you can go into the Ruins of Nar, which is another pack. Uh, I think it's C2. Um, and then once you exit the Ruins of Nar, you come right back here. So you set this back up just like it was. Um, but I have no interest in doing that. Uh, so now a, a snake, which snake is a monster, so you have to fight it. It has one hit point. To wound is the three. Its armor class is three. It's lunge and poison. Well, it's nice I have that. Uh, so I'm immune to poison. Um, and then Lunge is the ability, and uh, as I showed before, they have abilities. Um, each monster may or may not have abilities, so there is a list in that you can print up that has all of the different abilities. In this case, uh, Lunge, the monster attacks before the hero on the first turn uh, at plus two to wound. In general, unless they have Lunge or some other item, the hero always attacks first. Um, and then the other important pieces, ties always go to the hero. And then uh, combat is really simple. So I'm going to use the dark die for the hero, the lighter colored die for the monster. Uh, the monster is going first. So really all it is is when you're attacking, you add your dice roll to your to wound. And when you're defending, you add your dice roll to your armor class. So the attack would be to wound is 3, plus a 4 is 7, but they're plus 2 on the first turn. Uh, so that's 9. Now he has a defense of 6, so 6 plus 4 is 11, so he does not get wounded. Uh, the snake has 1. So now it's the hero's turn. So if you roll your dice, a 10 is a lot more than a 1, so 16 is more than 4, so takes a wound, the snake dies. Move on to another turn. Uh, this is the way out, so if you're really wounded and you're hurt and you don't want to die, uh, you can get out, you automatically heal, um, and then you can go on a different adventure. You can sell for gold or keep your equipment or whatever, but I don't need to leave yet. So now another uh, monster. This is a level 1 monster who has 1 hit point, also has lunge, so again, dark die is the hero, light die is the monster. Oh, so 7 plus the 4 is 11, plus 2 is 13. That is more than 10, so he loses a hit point. Now he can attack back, uh, and then he has 8 plus 6 is 14, which is more than 13, so dead monster. And we're going to keep on moving out. Um, so now he's found one of... Uh, the uh, non-player characters, uh, henchmen, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so we will keep him around. Uh, and he gives him a plus two against hordes. So next is a place um, where you can have a village. The hero can stop. Three vigor checks. And this is the same card that we looked at before. I didn't shuffle very well. Um, so a vigor check would be, for him, a seven. So you can do it up to three times. A one is better than seven. He heals. No point in doing the rest. And that's how you play the game. And you keep playing uh, until you get to the bottom. There are a lot more monsters than other things. Uh, so, for example, next we'd have had another monster. Then another monster. Oh, then a pack dog to, that helps. More monsters. More monsters. Uh, a lance. Uh, so, you go to the end. You eventually get to the bottom deck and your hill giant is who you're fighting this time that's you fight him if you die you die if you beat him you defeat this uh, scenario so 
that is basically the game in a nutshell. Um, once you've won, then or you leave the dungeon for whatever reason, then you recoup, you heal, any curses are lifted, uh, any blessings dissolve, uh, and you can either keep your equipment or you can uh, sell it for gold. All right, so what do I think of the game? Um, you know, I'm kind of torn on this one. Uh, I like that it's small. Um, it really does kind of evoke the old pen and paper RPG games I played when I was a kid. Um, as far as theme goes, it, it does hit the theme. It, it's not super immersive. Um, it's not like you name your own character and you roll and create their stats, so uh, that's a little bit of a hindrance to actually immersing yourself with the character and wanting to go on lots of adventures with him. Um, it is really simple to play. It's really small. I mean, really, you can take the deck and a couple dice uh, and take it with you anywhere. Uh, I like that you can mix and max, match the decks, so it does have a lot of replayability, I think. Uh, even within one deck with the scenarios, and then there are a lot of other scenarios that you can pick up. Board Game Geek, people have written their own, you can write your own. Um, there are a lot of different packs as well, uh, so you can really do a lot of different stuff. Um, now some of the things that are kind of weird about it is, I'm not sure what do you do with the gold at the end. So part of it is when it ends, uh, you have your character, so you can't play the same scenario with the character more than once if you're going to be doing a longitudinal uh, adventure with one character. Give, you can give it your own name. I, I think that would make it more immersive. I didn't do that. I didn't make up my own character. Um, so say I finish uh, one of the scenarios in pack C1. Well, according to the rules, I should then do a scenario from one of the other packs. Then I can come back to C1 and do a different scenario than I did before, which it does make sense you wouldn't do the same scenario over and over with the same character if you're going on. Um, and I get keeping the equipment, um, though I do think over time you might get a super-powered character, which would make it maybe too easy. Um, and then, but the gold thing, I, you know, okay, so I sell all my equipment, I've got bazillions of gold. I'm not sure what you do with it. Uh, I don't see a mechanism in here where you can buy equipment, you can level up, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, nice attempt at the role-playing RPGs, and it almost gets there. Uh, I just don't know that it has the longitudinal with one character. But from a replayability standpoint, it, there are lots and lots of adventures and you can do them differently each time and because you mix up the deck it's going to come in a different order. Um, now some of the other comments I saw online said it was hard and you shouldn't be winning that many. I seem to win more than half the time uh, which is okay. Um, but in general uh, I believe the theme is there. Uh, I like the the pen and paper on the cards to evoke the pen and paper that you used to use in the old RPGs. Um, and uh, it's very, it's family friendly. Anybody could play, any age could play this. Um, I guess it's, it's also very simple. The rules are quick to pick up. Uh, and uh, overall, I think it's a pretty good game. Uh, you can buy them for about 20 bucks a pack. And that's my other big downside is the starter deck, you can get a, have a special on a starter deck for $10, uh, well worth $10. Um, getting up to $20, i am not sure the value is there. I don't know that I'm getting a $20 game out of one pack. Um, and really, you probably need at least two or three packs for a lot of longevity in the game. Uh, but in general, it's kind of it's a fun game. It's an easy game. It's a portable game. It does evoke the old memories. And... Uh, it is, you know, fairly immersive for 20 minutes, um, but I don't know that you would play a longitudinal character, uh, you know, over time. Uh, really, I look at each game as it's sort of its own game. I haven't gotten, for me, I haven't gotten into the creating the character and hoarding gold and hoarding equipment and stuff. Um, but if you're into old-style RPGs and you want a solitaire version, I think the, uh, the $10 starter deck... Uh, would be well worth your investment uh, and then you'd have to make a decision whether it's worth $20 to get additional packs. I see sometimes they go on sale for $15. Um, I'm even kind of torn at that price at $10 all day long. $15, I think about it, $20, I'm not so sure. 
Uh, so anyway, if you can get a deck and play it and try it out, I highly recommend trying it if you like old school RPGs. Um, I know I usually use my scale, you know, for this one, I, it just does not fit that scale very well. But uh, if I had to do it, I would say it's an on the shelf and I'd pull it out every once in a while to play. Um, but really, for me, this is a, when I'm on a train or on an airplane, this would be really easy to play. So, alright, thanks for tuning in and uh, until next time, happy gaming.